Hello, buddy, and welcome to Where Are They Now in Sports, live from New York City. Today's guest is a former NBA professional basketball player that played in the league for 13 years. He played for six different teams, but he was known as a New York Knicks. Please welcome former NBA All-Star, Anthony Mason. In the house. How are you, man? I'm good. How's it going? So nice seeing you. I can't believe you're in front of me right now. I appreciate you having me. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> now, before we talk about what you're doing now, let's reverse the clock a little bit. Okay. Let's talk about your journey. Mm -hmm. When you went to Springfield Gardens High School in Queens, were you the man in high school? Were you like, oh, man, there's this dude named Anthony Mason. He's no joke. No, actually, I was a late bloomer. I just started playing basketball to my junior in high school and, uh, when I played for Springfield, you know, we had uh, Shamik, which is Rich Anderson, left-handed, great jump shot shooter. We had Norm uh, Norm Roberts, end up coaching St. John's, coached my son. He was a point guard. He was one of the men. And we, we had a lot of talent on our team. We was deep. Shannon Greer, Terry Keys. I just happened to have, probably had the best grades out of everybody. So my coach, who was like my father, Ken Fiedler, right now, he gave me a chance, and I just made the best of it. Now, your work ethic, tell me, like, Probably you were known your juniors and senior year, right? That's when people saying, oh, there's this guy named Anthony Mason from Springfield Gardens. What was your work ethic like when you were in high school? Well, my work, my work ethic is what made me. I, I never, you know, I never, I never took time off. You know, I played, even in, even once I made a pro, I played all summer. I was in a park. We had a park over on American Basley uh, called uh, uh, New Park. And the lights used to come stay on to about two or three in the morning. So I stayed in the park working on my craft, and and then I came back my senior year, and I was a little bit better. And then I went back to the park and kept on working on my game, and I ended up being like the only one to get a D1 scholarship out of that that class. And out of all the schools, you picked Tennessee State. Why Tennessee State? I'm sure there's a lot of colleges recruiting you. Honest reason? Go ahead, give me the honest reason. Yeah. That's country too, isn't it? It was eight to one chicks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe it. It was eight to one chicks. Then you had Fisk University up the block. That was about thirteen to one. So I went down there, and I, you know, you don't know about the South, so everybody's speaking to you and say, "Hey, how you doing?" And I'm like, "Oh, she liked me. Damn. <laughs> they like me." I didn't know that the South was just being polite. Um, you know, because that's how the South is. So I probably went for the wrong, wrong reasons, but it worked out. In the third round in the NBA draft in 1988. Okay. Yeah, the NBA was making mistakes that far back then. Of course. <laughs> but, you know, back to that draft, you know, your dream came true. You tell your parents, your loved ones, hey, I got drafted. But then, you know, you get cut by the Portland Trailblazers. How did, did that affect you? Did you say, oh my God, there's no way you're going to take my dream away like this? Right? I mean, what'd you do? You know what's funny about that? I didn't get cut, I left. Yeah, you know, I went over. I, I went overseas. You know, I I wanted to take care of my mother, and you know, at that time, going third round, nothing was guaranteed, and I felt like going overseas, the money was guaranteed, and I knew I would continue to work and try to bring myself back to this side. So I left for the guaranteed money. Yeah. All right. So after playing internationally, uh, you signed with the New Jersey Nets for a little bit, right? Right. And then uh, after that, you uh, played the CBA. Right. And then you demolished it there, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, you were tearing it up. You were like, I'm ready for the NBA now, right? Beast from the East. I always tell everybody, I said, you know, if you – I don't know if you look at it as unfortunate or whichever way you look at it because I think every step I took was a blessing. So I said, if you play in the CBA or the, or the D League now, which is under the NBA, I said, for you to prove to them that you belong on the next level, you have to dominate. You can't fit in. I see a lot of players go down there with a lot of talent – and they fit in. They just comfortable being one of the guys. I said, you got to stand out. You know, I was labeled Beast of the East. And uh, when I went somewhere and came back, the Beast returns and all that, you know, I was 30 and 15. And I mean, I showed them that I was trying to get to the next level. And that's what you got to do down there. But it was so competitive down there. I mean, you had to play every night. I'm not, you know, the NBA was super competitive back then. You know, now it's a little different. But um, every night in the CBA, somebody was trying to go to the NBA. Now, how did the Knicks come on to you? How did that come to you? Well, it's funny because uh, after uh, I used to play in a Maurice Stokes game, which was a, a charity game that in case, you know, uh, retired NBA players fell on an unfortunate time, they would raise money and try to help out the families if they ever got sick or whatever the case may be. So I played in that game all the time. I always felt that it was – I just thought it was a great cause. 
I always made the time. Back then, Mark Jackson played, Chris Mullen played, Walter Berry played. Everybody put in the time. You know, later on, guys got too big for it. But I thought it was a, uh, a worthy cause. And I remember I was playing uh, on the team, and Paul Silas was coaching. And, uh, you know, Paul Silas is straightforward. I love him to death. That's my guy. He's straightforward. He's like, I can curse on him? Yeah, go ahead. Oh. He's like, what the fuck you doing down here? You need to be up there with us. And at that time, getting cut, you know, from Jersey, when I, I thought I was one of the best players there, um, I didn't believe in the NBA no more. I was like, yeah, whatever. He's like, serious, you should give it a shot. We got six open contracts here. You know, we only got six guaranteed. We got six of them. I said, yeah, whatever, whatever. You know, I don't really believe in that. I was going to go overseas. I had a, had a job going to Israel. And um, it was funny how God works because every year you had to commit overseas because of the time. You had to commit overseas by the time training camp came. For whatever reason, this year, you went to training camp. They moved the date up or overseas went later. And I could actually go to training camp and still go overseas. So I was like, I'm going to go and get that little money that they pay you know, to go to training camp. And then I ended up with a great coach and, you know, Pat Riley, who, who was legendary, that didn't care what school you went to, didn't care what your name was. He just cared that you could play. And I got my opportunity. So, you know, that's the, the rest was history. Mace, tell me the feel. What it's like. Look, I'm a New Yorker. You're a New Yorker. My dream, and I have a baseball background, was to play for the New York Yankees, all right? All right. You make the team with the New York Knicks, all right? Now, tell me this feeling right here, all right? You go in the locker room for the first time and you see your jersey. It says Mason in the back and New York in the front. It, that, did that dream just come to reality? Like, wow, I can't believe this is happening to me. You know, it's funny. Uh, when I made the Nets, you know, for one year, I was like, yo, I'm literally across the bridge. My family could come see a lot of games. Yo, this is a dream. Wow, you can't get no better than this. So to end up with the Knicks, you know, right in your hometown, it was it was everything it could be. You know, everybody asked me, what's your highlights of, you know, your years with the Knicks? And my highlights is just seeing my family in the stands every game, seeing my mom there, you know, seeing my kids there. You know, that, that was my highlight. You know, basketball is fun and within itself, but I'm always been a realist and families first and just seeing their enjoyment that they didn't have to watch me on TV in California or something, that they could come there every night. That was that was my biggest highlights with the Knicks. But, but, but Mace, but what about your friends and like, yo, Mace, you remember me, man? Can you get me tickets? Did you have guys like that too? Oh, it was funny. We 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 had we had some guys, you know, that uh, all of a sudden became fans and right. and oh, I knew you could make it. And it was specific guys that I remember saying, "You'll never make it. You're garbage and all that." And I always said, like, as soon as somebody says something to me, like, yo, can I get a ticket? I'm a, I said, I'm going to let them have it. I'm a, I'm a dog. Man. I just never did. I think at that time, I just felt how blessed I was. And I was like, it wasn't even necessary to bring up old stuff. So when they would say congratulations and I knew you always make it, I was like, hey, I appreciate that. And I gave them tickets and all that. I mean, I mean, besides your family, I mean, I had New York there. You know, I grew up in New York. I was in every borough. I had friends there, family there. It was, it was crazy. So when you guys went out to restaurants, whatever, it was just handed to you, right? Oh, it was crazy. It was crazy. <laughs> you know, as, you know, it's funny, and we'll talk about that later, but uh -huh. something you just made a point of uh, is why I'm in the business I'm in today, you know, because stuff was handed to you. Mace, your money's not good here. You know, this is good. Oh, you got your family. That's cool. They're good, too, you know. But for whatever reason, NBA players and, and NFL players and MLB players, we're going to find something to spend money on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, with the, you know, you started with the Knicks in the 91 season uh, under head coach Pat Riley. That's his first year as a Knicks. Right. What did you learn a lot from Pat Riley? You know, what, you know, like Phil Jackson, he has that triangle offense thing going on, which I don't know what it means when I hear analysts saying there's a thousand ways to do it. I talked to Charles Oakley yesterday. Man, this is just Pass the ball around, man. What's so hard about that, right? So anyway, what did you learn from Pat Riley? What, what was the strategy with you guys? What I learned from Pat Riley and always stuck in my head from basketball to business to anything is preparation. He was the best preparation coach I've ever been around, the best mental, mental guy in anything. I mean, there was nothing you didn't believe that you can do after he gave one of his speeches or after he prepared you and you went to your practice, there's no way you practiced three and four hours and ran sprints and, and, and didn't think you was prepared. So as far as preparation in anything, I feel that's one thing he taught me. During practice, 
Is he like a hard nose that if he sees something not automatic, he's going to say, all right, do it again on a play? No, no, he's definitely hard nose. What I loved about Pat Riley is he gave you three and four and five ways to do everything. And, and because he was smart enough to know, you know, you put reference to the triangle where everybody thinks the triangle is automatic offense, which it's not. Um, Riley showed you that there's five or six ways to do everything. The game changes. There's different speed. You're going to play against different people with different talents, taller people, shorter people, faster people. So you're going to have to figure out how to do things different ways. So in a pick and roll, he would show us five or six ways to defend it. In, the, in, in just switching, he would show us five or six ways to defend it, five or six ways to get in position to rebound, five or six ways to play defense. So he had your mind so trained that as soon as the situation arose, you adapted. You know, when you get in this stuff, these egos now, this is the way it goes and this is how it is. When it doesn't work that way, you, you, you caught. You sit there like, what's going on? I thought this was automatic. You know, so one thing about him is he gave you a whole lot of options. And how was he? You know, Mace, when you know when he calls a timeout, the game is on the line. You, you see some coaches on the court, you know, when you need a bucket real quick to tie the game or to get ahead. Some coaches scream, they motivate you and all that. What was his thing? Was he calm when he'd get the, the board and say, hey, Mace, you guys do this and this or whatever the play was? You know what? Pat, Pat Riley was honest. He might have been calm one minute. He might have been yelling another minute. It depended on the situation. One thing I did like about Pat is anything that happened in-house stayed in-house. I, didn't, I don't like these coaches now that do an interview and, yeah, our power forwards wasn't doing this and, and so-and-so, if he would have gave us more. That's, that's, that's really that just gives the media uh, fuel to the fire. Whatever's in the house stays in house. You fix it in house because it's nobody's business. Because that same guy that you might be dogging, all of a sudden he takes off. Now they're gonna ask him about something. He's gonna dog the coach, and it just goes on back and forth. So I think that's what I respected more about. And you're talking about a legend. You're talking about a guy that could have said anything he wanted to, got away with anything he wanted to say, did whatever he wanted to, and he didn't do it. He kept everything in house, and and I respected that about him. And I know if he hadn't. I'd have had a whole lot of business in the street, much as me and him bumped heads. <laughs> so when you guys played against the Bulls in the playoffs, I know it was like physical. You know, I was watching YouTube clips yesterday, and I'm like announcer saying, this is war, fellas. This is what you're looking at right now, okay? Was there a strategy that Pat Riley had against the Chicago Bulls? How do you stop this guy? How do you set the pick with this guy? I mean, was there all that stuff involved? Well, there's definitely different strategies for different people, but one thing about Pat was he was like, impose your will. We're not playing nobody else's game. We're playing Nick basketball. We're up in your face. You're going to feel our presence. No layups. You know, we imposed our will. And that's what you, you could look at the Knicks and say, that's their identity. There's not going to be no layups. There's not going to be no easy baskets. And now you look at basketball and teams don't have identity. They're talking about Cleveland Cavaliers. They don't have a defensive identity. I said, they don't have a defensive player. How, do, how are you going to have a defensive identity? I'm not, I'm not dogging them. They just don't have guys known. For defense, you have to play, you have to be a you can't take a bunch of guys that can't play defense, put a defensive strategy in, and all of a sudden they become the best defensive players in the world. Just like you can't do it if you got non shooters, you can't put in the offense, and all of a sudden everybody can shoot. So I mean, you got to realistically. One thing I like about Pat Riley, and a, another thing I like about Don Nelson is they adapted to your talent. And Don Nelson probably more than anybody. He's like, Mason can dribble the ball. We're going to let him play the point. You know, we're going to let, we're going to put this mismatch. I used to love Nelly for that. He adapted to, he looked at his personnel and said, this is the offense I'm going to put in based off my personnel. Not this my offense you fit in. That's one of the hardest things to do in anything. And even when you're raising kids, I mean, you can't raise all your kids the same. You can't yell the same and you can't say the same thing. So you got to adapt to their personalities, which is the same way in anything. As a boss at a job, you can't treat all your employees the same. You got to, you know, handle some with kid glove. Some can take it. Riley said if me and him was together another five, six years, I probably would have been suspended every year. He said because one thing he knew was I can take it. And when I came back, I was going to play hard. He said he would have done that to other people. They might have quit on him, you know. So Riley was smart enough to know his personnel. Now against the Bulls, back to the Bulls, you guys were really physical. Mace. Anybody that comes to your lane, you're throwing them on the ground. I mean, you just can't allow this guy to score against you, especially on a dunk. All right. Now, did Pat Riley tell you guys, guys, be Knicks basketball, be physical. I don't care, just get it done. Was it that? Was he like that? It was a war each and every night. We didn't say, oh, we got to play harder against the Bulls than we got to play. We played hard every night. That's why New York fans to this day embrace us. 
in the 90s Knicks, the whatever. And it's the early 90s. It's mm -hmm. not the late one. But anyway, they, embra they embrace that because one thing about New York fans is they know basketball. It's, I've been to other stadiums, and a guy might knock me over, and I flip three times, and the ref call a foul, and the crowd boos. I mean, you don't know basketball. It's a foul. It's a foul. New York respected basketball, and what they did respect was effort, and that's what we gave night in and night out. You was going to get maximum effort. You was going to get physical play. You was going to get up in your face basketball, and that's why they loved us. Now, when you guys were on the road, that's Chicago, Indiana, whatever, right? And they know there's a playoff game. You know, you guys are going crazy. The beat blows it up. You guys, you know, like this, almost fights during games. Right. Can you guys actually leave the hotel for lunch the next day? I mean, was there a lot of security? No, there's more security now than it was then. Um, and actually, we were respected everywhere. We had fans everywhere. I mean, when you do something right and you play it the right way, Regardless of whether I'm, you're a hometown team or a away team, people respect that. I mean, we used to go to Miami. We thought we was in New York. You know, we go to Jersey. We thought we was in New York. It was a lot of places. We had fans in Chicago. I mean, you know, that might have been the only one where they had more fans there. But almost everywhere, L.A., everywhere, we had fans because they respected the way we played ball. Now, Mace, when you dunk on somebody and when you talk to them, what do you say to these guys? Like, you can't guard me? Like, is it trash talking going on? No, I say, sir, are you all right? Uh, you want to get up? <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, back then we trash talk. We talked a lot of junk. We stood over them. We scowled, and I think that was the most fun in basketball. The way they, the way they do stuff now, they they too worried about the wrong things. You know, I mean, don't get me wrong. You can't just talk up and down and up and down the court. But if I shake you and you fall, why can't I say get up? You know, why can't I laugh? I mean. That's just basketball. That's all part of the game. You can't. You look at any park. You go to any park, any recreation center, and see basketball. People are talking. People are talking. So now you're gonna say we're gonna make money off of this sport, but we're gonna take that out. It makes no sense. Yeah. It makes no sense. Now, speaking of parks, right? During the off season, do you actually go play? What's that park in Harlem? Uh, it starts with an R. Rucker. Rucker. Yeah, Rucker. Do you actually play this or the, while you were in the I, I, season? I never played in Rucker. I played. Uh, I probably played in Rucker once or whatever. I played in East Orange. I played in Jersey Shore. I played. I played all summer. I played in every tournament with a uh, prime time. James Ryan was our coach. We used to win every championship all throughout New York, New Jersey. We played in Seoul in the hole. We, we I, I, that was my workout uh, back then. You, you get a lot of people with trainers and working by themselves and doing sprints. That's kind of monotonous, so it gets redundant and it's boring. Mm -hmm. So when you play, it's competitive. You stay in shape, and that's what I did every year. Mace, who was the guy that gave you a hard time when it comes to rebounding? Like you'd be like, wow, this guy is like actually strong, man. As far as boxing, because I, I know you were diesel back then too. I mean, I get it. But who was the guy that was like, well, this guy's got a little power on me? Well, that's a hard question. On another team probably didn't. Uh, on my own team, me and Oak used to go at it. Uh, that's where the competition started, and that's what made us both great rebounders when we played other people, just our battles against each other. Xavier, you know, at one time it was Xavier, Oak, and myself all on the same team, banging, rebounding drills, getting ready to fight and all kind of stuff just in a rebounding drill alone. So, you know, that's where you were taught to rebound. It wasn't uh, – I could get rebounds on anybody. Uh, as far as the toughest player to probably guard that gave you a little difficulty and it was because of his point guard would have been Carl Malone. So when you were playing for the Knicks, you also, um, you know, had a part on New York Undercover and um, what else did you have? Oh, New York Undercover in the movie, the film Eddie, <laughs> basketball film. Now, did you actually have to audition for that or did you say, hey, they offered you the part? And celebrity with Woody Allen. Uh, yeah, celebrity. Yeah, I was about to uh, no, I didn't have to audition. They they knew talent when they saw it. Oh, uh, I love it they man. knew talent when they saw it. They they knew they'd get a personality on there. I actually, when I got traded um, to Charlotte, I actually was gonna get a full season on New York Undercover. So that kind of that kind of hurt me at that time because I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun uh, acting, you know, in the different roles I had. Eddie was fun. Uh, <laughs> Just being on the set. How many takes did it take for that scene right there? I actually was good. I mean, I don't think you could find a director that said, damn, we had to we had to do it over and over and over with Mace. I was pretty good. I mean, I, I did it, and it was over. They was like, great, next. You know, a lot of people did retakes, but I, I really was never a good I, – I was pretty good at it. Let's talk about the haircut back okay. then, all right? Let's see. Remember that haircut you used to have, those wacky haircuts? All right, what made you get those haircuts? <laughs> it was just, just my identity. I had a great barber who I still – 
still is like a family uh, member to this day. Alfredo Villa, he's still on uh, at Cuddy's on uh, Parsons and uh, Hillside, right across the street from Hillcrest High School. I still go there. I still do designs every now and then, and that, he was great, and I just did it. You know, it just something to separate myself from everybody else. When did you establish a relationship with LL Cool J? And I, I, this, I hear in the New York Times some guy wrote an article. You went to his house. You were like his bodyguard, a close friend when it comes to people freestyling upcoming rappers and stuff like that. When did you meet LL? Well, at that time, every you know, whoever was up and coming in Queens or whatever the case may be, end up gravitating towards each other or you end up in the same spot or whatever. And, you know, I enjoyed LL's rap, so he was literally in Farmers and I used to live on uh, Spring. I used to live uh, in Laurelton, which wasn't far. Then I moved to Merrick, which was right down a block from Farmers. This so, during your teenager days? yeah. Oh, so okay. I moved to Merrick and uh, uh, Merrick and uh, Ursina Road, which was right down a block from Farmers. So we crossed paths and met each other. And he was always a cool, down to earth guy. And he knew he could rap. You know, which you admire about a person if you know you could do it. You know, then flaunt it. So, you know, we met in passing, you know, at different parties, different things. I knew his DJs and stuff like that. So we in the same circles. I mean, you know, you had a great run with him. Right. When you got traded, did you take it personally? Yeah, I did because uh, we had a meeting a little while before that, and they had uh, Oakley, and, <coughs> excuse me, John, myself, and Pat. And I'm not going to name the guy, but he said, this is going to be the nucleus of the Knicks. This is what we're going forward with, and uh, we look forward to doing big things. And next thing, I had a different uh, zip code. So, you know, I did take it kind of personal. I, I wasn't, you know, New Jersey, when I got cut from Jersey, it hurt <clears throat> just because I was young. But I don't know. I felt that I did a great job with the Knicks. I felt I was one of their own. So I took it more personal than I probably should. I learned later that it's just a business and, you know, you got to make business decisions as owner, manager, whatever. So, you know, I learned later that it was a business decision, but, yeah, I did take it personal. When you play for the Charlotte Hornets, your first time back at the Garden, were you thinking like, man, I'm going to rip these players apart, but you don't want to. I mean, these are your boys, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> did you have that feeling? I don't know about the boys part. I definitely – Want to rip them apart and prove they made a mistake, and that's probably some of the worst things you can do when you get ready to play a game, as opposed to just letting the game come to you. You you're so anxious, you want to show them, you want to show them. And uh, I don't even know if I had a good game that game. I remember the first time I got to play against New Jersey when I was with the Knicks, and I think I was missing all kind of layups and stuff. You're just too anxious. You gotta, you know. And I tell you to my kids that you gotta just let the game come to you, no matter how, because you're gonna get in some game that you're gonna remember. This guy overlooked me, or they took that guy instead of me, and you're going to be anxious. Just let the game come to you. So you retired after the Milwaukee Bucks. What would you tell these young kids right now that you really want to get their dreams accomplished? What would you tell them? The one thing I can tell them is, is you have to believe in you, regardless of what anybody says. I was supposed to be a tweener. I was supposed to be not big enough, uh, this and that, you know, whatever. And I believed in me, even when it came to a contract situation with the Knicks. One year they had offered me $9 million and and I thought after the year I had, I wasn't taking that. And they was in the paper, oh, he's going to get traded and this and that. And I believed in me. And my agent said, what you want to do? I said, I'll, I'll, I'll roll the ball. I'll roll the dice. And he was like, well, you believe in you, I believe in you. So I would tell the kids, believe in yourself because you're the only one that's going to accomplish it, regardless of <clears throat> how, many somebody, how many shots somebody rebound for you. How many passes somebody give you? You're the one that got to get out there and do the work and make the shots and become that player. So believe in yourself regardless of what anybody tells you, uh, regardless of what the stats are, the statistics. Because when I was in Tennessee State at the time, it's, it's one out of 50,000 or 20,000 that's make it from this level of basketball. And I said, I'm going to be that one then. So what are you doing now besides pimping a nice suit, you know, <laughs> looking good, you know, nice office? Right now I'm in the insurance business, and I, I got into it uh, just looking at all these shows about athletes making bad decisions, not not just basketball players, but football players and and, and baseball players. Football players more so because their, their contracts are not, not guaranteed. And insurance is 150% needed. There's no way around it. You can't say, I don't need it, this and that. Even if you have $600 million in the bank, you say, well, you know what, I'm going to leave money to so-and-so-and-so. 
the government's still getting a piece. There's insurance products that protect the tax, you know, lien on, on, on your estate. So insurance is super important. And I felt that once I learned the nuances of insurance, that I can get out here and get these athletes and, and some entertainers and the people that make a big amount of money in a small window of time to make better decisions. Because with insurance, you can set yourself up for life on the first day of your contract, on the first day of your entertainment contract, on the, especially in football when you get signing bonus. Through insurance, you can set yourself up for life. And I wish more people would listen and learn the nuances of insurance. It's not just about <clears throat> it's not just about dying, which was one of the reasons I didn't get it when I was coming up. You know, and my story is more based off of I didn't take insurance. This is what happened. When my mother was diagnosed with cancer six years ago, I had to pay out of pocket because I didn't have insurance. Now, God, you know, fortunately for me, I had it. She's still here at 89 years old, and she'll be 90 in February. But if I had insurance, I wouldn't have to pay anything, you know. And that's just some of the things that I try to, you know, I want to teach. It's not about you dying because that is, you know, when you think insurance, you're like, man, it makes I'm 21. Why I need insurance? Estate planning. You know, later down the line, there are cash accumulation vehicles where it's like it's almost like an investment. You could be making money and have a death benefit attached. There's no other product for that. Then you have the the long term care aspect. God forbid your kids get sick, your parents get sick. You know what a hospital bill is? Yeah, right. <laughs> so you got you got those in place and that's just that's just why I've been into it for the last three years with the whole talent group. A great, great company. Bobby Hotel and his wife Gina Hotel, man, they treat you like family. You know, you get some of the people that you grew up with and stuff like that. You know, that ducked on you when things went bad. And I got a guy that didn't know nothing about me, and his wife that didn't know nothing about me that gave me an opportunity. You know, when stuff was a little shaky because I didn't have insurance, because I didn't know what to put my money in, because I didn't bother to learn the things that I want these guys and girls and stuff to learn now. And I was blessed enough to still be marketable. So when people found out what I was doing, they were like, yeah, Mace, I'll do it with you. Yeah, I'll do business with you. So I was able to build myself back up. There's a lot of people that <clears throat> don't get that opportunity. I've had my run-ins with people, but at the end of the day, for the most part, I was good to everybody. I was accessible to everybody. If you want an autograph, I gave you an autograph. I stood out two and three hours signing autographs, even if I was on my way somewhere, because I just felt like that was just something you should do. You know, it was just something you should do. Not, not that you had to do it, just something you should do. You, you know, you got time. Without these people screaming your name or without you being a demand or people wanting to come see you, you, you know, you never make that name or you never get that money. So, you know, from that, and my advice to <clears throat> athletes and entertainers and stuff is two things. Learn about finance. Learn about insurance. And when, you, when, you, when you're at, that, at the top of the game or – top of the rap game or top of whatever business you're in, be a good person because it always comes back. I had a basketball camp that I ran for 15 years up in uh, Glens. Hold on, hold on. I just want to fix that suit, man. It's going too high on you. Hold on. <laughs> hold on. I don't want to. There you go. Yeah, yeah. So keep it like that. All right, go ahead. Well, actually, just go back again. <laughs> go ahead. I had, a, I had a basketball camp that I ran 15 years uh -huh. up in Glens Bay, New York with Ken Fiedler, Scott Fiedler, Jay Fiedler. Used the quarterback with the you know Jets and Miami, and you'd be surprised how many kids I see here in the city now, CFOs and CEOs. Mace, I went to your basketball camp. You were such a good person to us. Oh my God, anything I can do for you, just let me know. So just be a good person. I'm not saying that you don't you owe nobody nothing. You hear everybody, oh you owe people your own. You don't owe nobody anything. You worked hard. You got to that position, but don't be an asshole neither. You know, so be a decent person. Hey, how you doing? Somebody speak to you, answer the question, keep it moving, take care of your family. It comes back around because, unfortunately, most of us need business after basketball, after football, after baseball. You shouldn't because we get paid well. And if you learn some of the stuff that I'm trying to teach now, then you probably won't. But for the most part, you do. So be that kind of person that people want to deal with. No, I totally get it. But, Mace, in your 20s, were you thinking like that too when you were in the league? No, not at all. Not at all, and you didn't really have people telling you. I mean, even even the ones that you did, like I, I give my agent credit, Don Cronson. He was like, mate, save your money, you know, defer it, you know, do this and that. And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> sure I will. Yeah, I'll do it tomorrow. I mean, it, most of the, it's sad that you got to learn the hard way, uh, but sometimes you do. So me being a former player, I would hope that they would listen to me more without falling into the hole first and then learning that they would say, wait a minute. 
Mace played. He knows what he's talking about. And the fact that I'm honest and say that I messed up a lot of money, that I wasn't insurance-wise prepared, uh, that they would look at it and say, well, since he's being honest, you know, I might as well listen to this. Because, I, you know, like I tell my kids, you seen me play, you seen your older brother play, if you did the same mistakes me and him made, you're, you're the stupid one. Or if the, or the son after that, if you make mistakes after you've seen two or three, so it's the same thing. If you can tell these kids before they run into a hole how not to go into that hole and they don't listen, you know, then it's, it's bad on them. But we should do our part. In, in how it is, you're a dad, you know what I mean? Isn't it hard for kids to actually listen, but they'd rather listen to another voice than their own personal father? I mean, does that work with you? Or your kids are like, all right, if you tell your son, yo, you're, you're weak on your agility, you got to work on your plyometric, will he be like, all right, dad, I want to work on that? Or he'll be like, whatever, what are you talking about? I've been fortunate. I tell my kids, because I'm more, I'm probably more brutally honest than most parents, so I don't even say you need to work on your agility. I say you suck right now. If you want to get better, that's the work you need to put in. They respect it, and they put in the work, and they become successful. That's one thing I would advise parents, you know, since I'm giving advice all out. Be honest with your kids. Don't, don't, be, don't be a crutch to them by blaming it on everybody else. And and it's everybody else's fault. And, because then they'll walk around with that crutch, and they'll never take responsibility. You know, if you can be honest with your kids and say, look, your jumper sucks right now. You need to take 300 jumpers a day to work on it. He'll look at you and go, okay. Because he'll respect that you're being honest with him. The same way when they do something good, you tell them that also. Right. Dear, I see the improvement. I see you've been working on it. It's the same thing. Don't just always be negative. But at the end of the day, when you have to be negative, then you should be honest. True that. Now, what else you doing? I know you and Starks are probably a pizza investment or something like that. <laughs> yeah, me and Starks have a pizza restaurant on 123rd in uh, Manhattan um, in Harlem. It's doing very well. Uh, we plan, we um, waiting for investors to use the Starks and Mason name more because anything I think they put Starks and my name on in New York would be a gold mine. And if they're smart, they'll, you know, continue to do that. But, uh, yeah, we've, we've had this pizza shop now and it's been successful and hopefully we open up a few more. Oh, I can't wait. Yep. Okay. Anything else you're doing with your life? Uh, Any other investments or this is it? Insurance, pizza, what else? Insurance, pizza, and anything else I could put my business under. You know, Fan 14 is my company, and anything I'm doing is going to fall up under there. So there's some things in the works, but when that materializes, we'll talk about it. Well, you know, Mason, when I, when I call you in your voicemail, I, I love that voicemail. Why don't you just put that on YouTube? I, I, the way you said it, it's like it's reality. You know what I mean? Oh, it is. It Dude, is. I love that. It you know, is. It motivates people's uh, like oh, this guy. You know when you said, "Are you are you the same character when no one's around exactly. you?" Right. That's when your character's tested. I mean, you see a lot of people in front of people being the greatest guy, and then you, uh, what's the guy? What's the serial killer from Chicago? Iceman. Oh, no. Remember? No, nah, when, when he, when he, you saw that film? Yeah, you remember that? He was yeah. the Iceman. He's a great family man. Oh, yeah. yeah awesome yeah. family man. You don't know what he's doing behind. <laughs> exactly. You know, so, I mean, it, that's where your character is most tested. And it's easy to be, you know, smiling and good in front of people. It's when nobody's watching and how you carry yourself and what your beliefs are and what you believe in. Mace, if there was a movie about you, right? A biography about Anthony Mason. Who would play it? Who would play it, my man? Anthony Mason. <laughs> Anthony Mason, that's it. But let's just say, hey. Can't nobody else play it. What about a younger guy? <laughs> they need a can't, guy in the 20s. Can't, no, can't nobody else play it. <laughs> All right, this is Anthony Mason. Listen, so much having you on my show. This I appreciate great. you. And thank, thank you for, you know, we had difficulties down there. <laughs> you know, but uh, thank you so much. Really, it's been a pleasure having fun, uh, especially talking to you, keeping it real as usual. Oh, no doubt. So that's a New Yorker right there, just to let you know. <laughs> All right, thanks so much.